Amen. Speaking of Pentecostals, by the way, if you see the, the pictures pinned up on the back wall, the kids had a, a Joel Osteen uh, drawing competition. So there's all these like monster pictures back there. So that's what that's all about. My favorite one, I was just looking at it. My favorite one is the one kid didn't even draw a drawing. He just, he just wrote Joel Stinky. <laughs> 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 it's like, winner. <laughs> anyway, okay. John chapter 4, John chapter 4. So the miracle that we're talking about uh, this evening in John chapter 4 is, uh, I, I guess maybe some people wouldn't consider it a miracle. I, I think that it is still a miracle. But we're going to talk about the woman at the well uh, this evening. We're going to talk about the woman at the well. Not the miracle at the end of the chapter. We're going to talk about, and it's not a typical miracle, which is why uh, maybe it doesn't get counted sometimes or however people are counting as far as miracles. Because, you know, Jesus doesn't heal somebody or raise somebody from the dead or heal somebody's relative or something like that. Um, in this case, I'll point out where the miracle was, but it's just a very interesting story, a very inter interesting uh, interaction between Jesus and um, this woman at the well. So let's go ahead and get into the, the story um, this evening in John chapter 4, and then we'll see how we can apply that um, in our sermon series, Miracles of Jesus. Look down at John chapter 4 and verse number 1. The Bible says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, and then in verse number 2, it's interesting, we're going to do a little bit of a Bible study through this, and then we'll apply it at the end. It's interesting in verse number 2, it says, Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Turn to Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, and we'll, I'll explain to you um, why that is. So Jesus um, it says that the Pharisees, they heard that Jesus made more disciples and was baptizing more people than even John the Baptist. So here comes somebody greater than John the Baptist, which is why John the Baptist said that. And then in verse number two, it points out that Jesus didn't baptize himself. He had his disciples baptized. And Romans chapter six and verse number four kind of explains why it would be a little strange if Jesus did the baptizing because of what baptism actually stands for. Look at Romans chapter six and verse number four. The Bible says, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. So baptism, as we go into the water, it pictures us being buried with Christ, the Bible says. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So as we go into the water, we're being buried. It's a picture of us being buried with Jesus. And then as we come out of the water, it's a picture of us you know, coming out and walking in newness of life, being born again into a new life that we should uh, be living. That's why baptism comes after salvation. So baptism identifies us with Christ's death on the cross, his burial, and his resurrection. Look at John chapter 1 and verse number 4. John chapter, I'm John, John chapter 4 and verse number 3. So we see that Jesus, you know, he was making a name for himself. And he wasn't baptizing people. The disciples were doing it um, for him. But he was already getting a lot of attention here. Look at verse number 3. He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. So what this means is, so Jesus left Judea. And you kind of got to have a map in your head right now. Jesus left Judea, which was in the south, and he was headed to Galilee. Well, there was this spot. If you look at a map, you'll see that it's Judea, it's Samaria, and then it's Galilee. So what verse number four means is that he must needs go through Samaria. It wasn't that Jesus, you know, wanted to stop over in Samaria. It's that he literally had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. So it's kind of like, you know, if we drove to um, Washington, we would have to go through Oregon. Kind of the same thing. It just kind of sits in the center of those two um, territories. So he goes through Samaria and he meets this Samaritan woman. So the first thing I want to kind of study out a little bit, turn to 2 Kings chapter 17, is who are these Samaritans? Where did the Samaritans come from? Where is Samaria? Samaria is the land right in between um, Judea and Galilee. Look at 2 Kings chapter 17, and let's look back at the invasion of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrian Empire. So the Assyrian Empire, of course, 
came in to judge the northern kingdom of Israel, I think um, close to 200 years before you know, Babylon came and took over um, the lower kingdom um, of Judah. But the northern kingdom was much more wicked. They were much more fallen away. Of course, Jeroboam from the very beginning set up calves of gold and they left the Lord almost from the birth of the northern kingdom. And they just never got it right. And finally, ju God judged that nation. Look at 2 Kings chapter 17. And when the Assyrian Empire came in and took over the northern kingdom, um, it was not just, you know, this simple, it was much more brutal and it was much more complete than what happened in the Babylonian captivity. Look at 2 Kings 17 and verse 24. And the Bible says this, it says, And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim, if I'm not saying that right, I'm sure, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So basically, the, if you want to think about the land of Ephraim, just north of the kingdom of Judah, that is where what became um, this, this land of Samaria. And these became a mixed people, so to speak, because the Assyrians brought in their own people and they carried most of the Israelites away. So the northern kingdom, here you have this situation where the northern kingdom has already gone apostate. They've already left the Lord. They were carried off. Now all of these Assyrians come in, they take over, and they just, they basically take over the land. They mix in with all these people that remain there, okay? And look, fast forward 700 and some years is where we're at when Jesus meets this woman at the well. So basically, what I'm trying to get you to understand is at this point, you had an apostate kingdom taken over by a heathen people. They all moved in, and, you know, who knows what we have here? As far as a culture, a people, you know, they were considered, turn to John chapter 8, they were considered to be to the Israelites, to the Jews that were at, you know, in the time of Jesus, they were considered to be a very low people. They were considered to be, you know, they were, they were seriously looked down upon because of this history of where they came from. Look at John chapter 8 and verse number, we'll go back to verse number 47. And the Bible says, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So here's the Pharisees getting mixed up, you know, getting into the mix with Jesus. And Jesus is kind of rebuking them in verse um, number 47. He's saying, look, if you were of God, you would hear God's words. And then in verse 48, then answered the Jews and said unto him, say, well, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil. They're, say, they're like, you know, why don't we just, you know, aren't we, aren't we correct when we're just going to call you a Samaritan and demon possessed? So they're kind of like comparing, you know, Samaritans. They're, they're using this, they're, they're using a low term for Jesus when they call him a Samaritan and then also call him, you know, demon possessed as well. So Jesus, by the way, was from Galilee, which was, you know, if you were in, in Judah, that was a northern part that was past Samaria. So they're kind of, you know, not recognized as people of Israel, first of all. And, you know, that's why Jesus himself was kind of looked down upon. We'll get to that a little bit later because he was from Galilee. But remember, where was Jesus born? Remember, Jesus was born actually in Bethlehem. You know, his parents traveled south for the census that Caesar called to be taxed, right? And he was born in Bethlehem. Go back to John chapter 4. So we see who the Samaritans are. We see that they're considered a very low people. We, can see, we see that even the Pharisees used it to insult Jesus by calling him a Samaritan. Um, they're just, you know, they weren't even someone you should talk to if you were a Jew of Jesus' time. Look at John chapter 4 and verse number 5. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Therefore Jesus, therefore being wearied on his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So whenever you see the sixth hour, the ninth hour, this type of thing, you know, the Bible says that, you know, there was darkness over the land when Jesus was crucified from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, you start measuring from 6 a.m. So six, the sixth hour would be noon. So when Jesus was crucified, think about, you know, the, the centurion standing, you know, at the cross. You know, it was dark from noon to three o'clock. 
That is strange, okay? That's a miraculous event that people would notice that all of a sudden we're crucifying this guy and like the sun is not shining. So, I mean, that is something that people would take notice to. But anyway, here, back to the story, it's the sixth hour, it's about noon, okay? Look at verse number seven. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith, un Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. So Jesus is by himself, and his disciples are off buying food. Look at verse 9. Then saith the, wom the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asket drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So first of all, this is the first like, major point to bring up here. So this woman basically sees Jesus, and I'm sure it's the way that he looks, the way he's dressed, the way he talks. She recognizes that he is a Jew. And she says, why would a Jew even be talking to me? Because I am, you know, she's basically saying, I am nobody, is what this woman is saying. So, I mean, look, first of all, she's very humble, which is a key to this story here. And especially as the conversation continues with Jesus, we see how her humility really plays into how things turn out in this story. I mean, think about this, you know, soul winners. Think about this. How, you know, how do conversations go at the door when you meet somebody that is a very proud person? When you meet somebody that, you know, you just meet that person that either they have all kinds of things to tell you or, you know, they're just a very proud person about their, you know, their house or their, their possessions or whatever it is that they have. Look, those are quick conversations. Those conversations do not go anywhere. You know, I know everything, have a nice day, is basically how those conversations go. You aren't telling these people anything just because of their pride. So humility was the key to this woman's eternity, literally, here. Go back to John chapter 4, look at verse number 10. So she says, why would a Jew even be talking to someone like me? I'm just a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, he's going to tell her now. He's going to tell her, I'm going to tell you why I'm talking to you. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Basically, Jesus says, you know, Jesus basically points out, I mean, now we see a turn where we see that Jesus is not really interested in getting a drink. Jesus is soul winning here. Jesus is out, and he's interested in this woman's soul. And he basically says to her to start things off, he says, you have no idea who you're talking to. It's like, if you knew who you were talking to, you would be asking me for, you know, basically the gift of God is what he says. Look at verse number 11. The woman saith unto him, you know, she doesn't get it. She doesn't understand. Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with. She's still talking about physical water at this point. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? You know, she's still talking about getting water from the well, a certain type of special water. And in verse number 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. So he's trying to get her now off the physical onto the spiritual. Look at verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Turn to John chapter 7. So Jesus is saying that he's trying to give her uh, this well of water. Now he's trying to give her the water, remember? And he give her this water that springs into everlasting life. Jesus is literally talking about her salvation here. He's trying to give her salvation. He's trying to get this woman saved. Look at verse number uh, John chapter 7 and verse number 38. So we see um, another um, time when Jesus talks about, you know, water and water of life. Look at uh, verse 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So here we see this rivers of living water equals salvation. How do we get salvation? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But he spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth this is a prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? And the only reason I read those last couple verses there is because once again, we see that Jesus was considered lower because he was from these northern territories, Samaria and Galilee. Another reference there. And again, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, you know, just as the Bible prophesied. Go back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Look at verse 15. So he continues um, with this woman. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. So now she sees, okay, he's offering me um, something special here. Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Now here's the miracle. Now here's the miracle on why I can use it in this series. In verse number 18, he says, For thou hast had five husbands. And he, who now has, he, now, uh, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that said thou truly. So basically Jesus tells her, she's like, I have no husband. And he said, you, uh, you don't have a husband. You've been married five times, he tells her. And the guy that you're with now, you're not even married to. So he's basically pointing out like this. He basically just shows her her life story in sin right in front of her face in, you know, a couple sentences here. That's a unique miracle. There's no healing. There's no raising from the dead. But it's definitely not something that you or I could ever do. Look, Jesus wasn't stalking her on Facebook or anything like that. There's none of that. This was just, just God in the flesh just telling this woman that he knows everything about her. Okay? And basically, it's interesting because as Jesus is soul winning here, what does he start out with? What does he start out with? He basically starts out with saying, you're a sinner to this woman. Look back at verse 19. Not so different than us. You know, what's the first thing that we do? We point out to people that, you know, all have sinned. And there's none righteous. No, not one. No one is righteous. So he points out her sin to her in a pretty, I mean, in a pretty like in your face type of way, I would say. You know, I mean, you will be out soul winning and you will find that as you get more experience soul winning, you will find those moments, those people where you can feel comfortable, you know, kind of being a little bit more bold with them. If they're not understanding things, you know, I just did this on Wednesday night. We were, we were talking um, with a lady and she was not understanding the difference between what, you know, her Pentecostal church believed and what we were explaining. She was really twisted up and, and she's like, well, it's pretty much the same. And look, sometimes you can just kind of feel that you can take these liberties and as like, no, it's actually not the same. It is the difference. What we are talking about to you and what you told us at the door is the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation. It's not even close. It's not close. And look, you can find moments and you kind of just have to perceive these things when you can be sort of bold and, and really, you know, stretch and, and beg for people's souls in that way. By being bold in a loving way, in that way. Jesus was pretty in, in her face with this, but going back to the first part when we see this woman, she was very humble. She was a very humble woman. So how does she take it? How does she take it? Does she say to him, does she say to him, who do you think you're talking to, buddy? You know, she say, how dare you say something like that? Look at verse 19. And through her humility, the conversation goes in the direction where we know that this woman is just going to receive the truth. Look at verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. She says to him, You know, you, you must be a prophet. You, you've, you called it. You called my sin. This is the fruit of her humility right here. She doesn't say, Get out of here. She doesn't say, you know, how dare you say that? Look at verse 20. She says, yes. She says, yes. You're right. I am a sinner. You're correct. You must be a prophet. Look at verse 20. Our fathers, she says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27. Now she brings up an interesting 
um, she says, you know, you're a prophet. And now she brings up like where the Jews worship versus where the Samaritans worship. So the Samaritans kind of had a different area set up where they worship. They obviously, um, Judah or, or Judea is where Jerusalem was at, you know, to the south. Um, that's where the Jews were. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, let's look at what mountain she's talking about. Look at Deuteronomy 27 and verse number 11. So the Samaritans had a mountain set up. They had a, a temple, a place of worship in a certain mountain. Look at Deuteronomy 27 and verse number 11. And this is just, a, you know, just for sake of Bible study here so you know what she's talking about. Look at verse number 11. And Moses charged the people the same day saying, Moses is delivering the law here. He's delivering the law, and within delivering the law in Deuteronomy, he says in verse number 12, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over Jordan. And he lists six tribes of you know, the children of Israel. And then in verse 13, he says, And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse. You know, and he lists six more tribes. Moses is prophesying here that when they get into the promised land, they are going to, they're going to, they're going to go to this place where there's these two mountains, and six of the tribes are going to stand up on this mountain, and they're going to deliver the blessings of God, and six are going to stand on this mountain, and they're going to deliver the curses of God. So the Levites are in the middle, in the valley, and they're kind of dishing out um, both. But that is what um, one of the mountains that she's talking about. Turn to Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8. Turn to Joshua chapter 8 and look down at verse number 30. These, these mountains, uh, Ebal and Gerizim, have many other um, spiritual you know, aspects to them throughout the Bible. We'll just hit a few more. I can't really get to all of them um, for sake of time. But look at Joshua chapter 8 and verse number 30. The Bible says, Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. And as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses. We just read this. This is, the, this, is this prophecy that Moses gave in, in Deuteronomy chapter 27. It is coming to pass here in Joshua chapter 8. Because remember, we're studying through Joshua. They're now in the promised land. This is now happening. Okay, As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel... As it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord, and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel, and their elders, and officers, and their judges, stood on this side of the ark, on that side before the priests and the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the children or the people of Israel. So the point I'm trying to make is this area that the Samaritans had set up to worship has great spiritual significance. The Lord actually appeared to Abraham the first time telling him he would give him the promised land in this same area. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Hundreds of years earlier before they would even come into the promised land. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. So this area is not some area that was just unknown to the Israelites. Look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 6. Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 6. And Abram, Abram, he's not yet Abraham, passed through the land unto the place of Sishem, unto the plain of Morah. And the Canaanite was in the land, was then in the land. So this is before, way before, hundreds and hundreds of years before Abraham's descendants would actually come into the promised land, which we're studying in Joshua, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And he there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Turn to Genesis chapter 33. It's also where Jacob settled. You know, obviously, Jacob's well was there that was well known even to this Samaritan woman and the people in the area. Look at Genesis chapter 33. Genesis chapter 33. And look at verse number 18 where the Bible says, And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Seshem, which was in the land of Canaan, and he came from Padaranam and pitched his tent before the city. 
And he bought a parcel of the field where he spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Setram's father, for an hundred pieces of money, and he erected there an altar and called it Eloheh Israel. It's a special place, is what I'm trying to get at. And it turned into this special, you know, this special spiritual place that had this special place in, you know, the, the combined tribe or combined nation of Israel. It turned into a separation point between how the Samaritans were worshiping and how the Jews were worshiping. So basically, she was saying, you know, you're a prophet. And she's saying, why, you know, shouldn't you be worshiping in Jerusalem? That's where the Jews say you should worship. And we worship in this mountain. Okay, so Jesus basically says to her, go back to John chapter 4. He's like, it doesn't really matter where you worship. He's like, because what I'm going to tell you is much more important. Look at verse 21. Verse 21 of John chapter 4. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. And then he says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. So, I mean, again, this woman must be pretty, pretty humble because Jesus is saying, You Samaritans, you don't even know what you're worshiping up there. Jesus says, you, you worship, you're up there worshiping, you're sitting here telling me that we shouldn't be worshiping in Jerusalem, and he's like, you guys are up on this mountain, you don't even know what you're worshiping up there. You're just worshiping something. You know, and he says to her, you know, he says, you know, how I can talk, he's talking about the Samaritans in general. Why? Because he says ye. And ye is plural, by the way. So, I mean, this is why, you know, the ye's and the these and the thou's, I mean, this is important. It's important in the Bible because Jesus says, ye worship, ye know not what. He's like, you Samaritans, you Samaritans as a plural group, you guys, you don't even know what you're doing. You're up there worshiping whatever, a wall or a building or, you know, a calf or whatever. He's like, and, you know, he's, he's just saying, you know, salvation is of the Jews. Now, this is kind of a test. This is kind of a test. He says, salvation is of the Jews. What does he mean by that? He's saying, do you know what I'm saying? When I say salvation is of the Jews, look at verse 23. Look at verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He's like, it's not about, it's not about your mountain or our city. He's like, it's about the truth. It's about, you know, the salvation of the Jews, what that means. Look at verse 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now look at verse 25. Now the woman, so he's testing her. He's like, do you know what that means, that salvation is of the Jews, and how it doesn't matter, you know, up on the mountain, in the city? And he says, the woman says to him, she kind of like, she's heard of this before. She says, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. She says, I've, I've heard of this Messiah that's called the Christ. She's like, I've heard that he's coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us, is what she says. So, I mean, she kind of gets a C on the test here. She's heard of the Messiah, the idea of the Messiah, the Christ. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He says, it's me. I'm the Christ. I mean, well, first of all, this is like one of the best passages. You ever heard the stupid argument that like Jesus never claimed to be the Christ? I mean, it just Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be the Christ like so many times. But this is a pretty direct one right here where, you know, she says, I know that, that you know, the Messiah cometh. Well, which Messiah? She could have been talking about any Messiah, which is called Christ. And Jesus says, I, you know, that speak unto thee am he. I mean, that... You know, I mean, it's not, you know, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to figure that one out. Jesus just said, I am the Christ, right here, to this woman. Bam, there's the gospel. There's the gospel by Jesus. Look at verse 27. So, I mean, that was a pretty simple, you know, gospel presentation by Jesus. Basically, you know, Jesus walking up to a door, you know, saying, have you heard of, you know, do you know what all this, you know, salvation of the Jews is all about? You know, do you, do you know that, you know, you've been into all this sin and people are, yeah, and you, you heard about, you know, the salvation of the Jews, you know what that means? And, she, and people say at the door, they're like, yeah, I've heard that maybe there's going to be a Messiah. And Jesus would just be like, I'm the Messiah. 
You know, and Jesus just knew this woman's heart. Look at verse 27. Look at verse 27. And came, and upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seeketh thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So she goes to the city and she's like, I found the Christ. I mean, how could this have been? Look, she basically says this man performed a miracle for me and this must be the Christ. She goes and tells all these people. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him to eat? And well, for, let me just back it up just for a second here. And then they went out of the city and came unto him. So this woman, let me just go back for a second. This woman... This woman who's been married five times and is in fornication with the current man that she's with, she is clearly a woman that is probably not, you know, the upper echelon of pe when people think of someone's reputation in this town. This woman goes, she finds out who Jesus is, and the first thing she does is runs to the entire town and gets basically the entire town to come over to Jesus. You know, it reminds me a little bit of a story we just read in Joshua about a woman called Rahab. A woman called Rahab, who basically, the Bible says, she just packs her house with her brethren. Because anybody that was not going to be inside the walls of her house was going to be killed. And it says, they went and they got Rahab and all her brethren and her kin. I mean, every, she got everybody into her house. It's funny. It's funny how we may look down on certain people, but it's funny how some people will get saved. There's just a side note that I just thought of when I was writing this sermon. It's funny how some people will get saved and just like, just like, just hammer the gospel home to all their family and all their friends and all this and just be able to get everybody on board. Lot! Lot couldn't get hardly anybody. You know, it makes you wonder, you know, maybe, you know, we should just not judge people after they get saved and just see what they can do in their families they, as they grow, as they, you know, I mean, because you'll see that. You'll see that today. You'll see people get saved and just like, just push and just get all their family saved or a large portion of their family saved and just be this incredible blessing upon the people that were in their lives. So that's a great thing. And this woman was a, a great example of this. Look at verse uh, 33. Therefore saith the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him uh, to eat? But, you know, Jesus had already said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Jesus saith to them, My meat is, due to, the, is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not thee that yet there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Jesus, when he was on this earth, was constantly doing an accounting of souls. He was constantly doing an accounting of, you know, all... I mean, he saw the damnation in front of him. He saw the guilty in front of him. And he was always redirecting people to the real problem here. And the real problem is that everybody's unsaved and the fields are white unto harvest. That means that, look, if you go harvest it, you've got it. Meaning, if pe these people knew the truth, they would accept the truth. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and he that and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is saying that is true. One soweth and another reapeth. I say you to reap whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and you're entered into their labors. You know what this says here? This says that when you go out, maybe, maybe you go out two, three, four weeks in a row, and like nobody gets saved, it means that you're still sowing. It means that you're still out there sowing. Because look, you know how many people I know that are, that are just sold out Christians today that they had to get the gospel given to them like several times. Somebody had to come and knock on their door or give them the gospel again and again and again. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about here. So if you have somebody that gets the gospel, and they, they need to hear the gospel four times before it'll finally all click and they can finally, you know, they hear the gospel and then maybe they need to, you know, because look, if you've been raised your whole life in a false belief, you know, that's a long bridge to cross in 25 minutes. So don't forget that when you're out there and don't feel like, 
you have to slam that person across the finish line. Because, you know, we're out there to sow. And if somebody has spent 35 years, 40 years, 45 years, 50 years in a false gospel and false beliefs and a false religion of whatever kind of system that it is, look, they may just have to think on that. I mean, they may have to listen. Just what, what you need to do is make sure you get it across clearly and completely. And then if they're thinking on it, you just let them think. You just let them think. Let that thing soak in. Let that seed, you know, soak there for a while and germinate. And then somebody else will come along. And then they will sow again. And then somebody will harvest. So the, the Bible is saying here that there's a lot of people like that. Look at verse 39. Verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. So this woman went out and she got a whole bunch of people saved here. Yeah. She got a whole bunch of people. Now there's two groups of people here. This, go, this woman goes out immediately after she got saved and she's like, can you believe it? And look, I mean, you should kind of feel like that after you got saved, quite honestly. If you really got it, if you really got it and you understand that, okay, I just trusted in Jesus, and now if I walk outside and get hit by a car, because look, it's pretty easy to die today. I mean, we're pretty fragile people. We're pretty fragile machines here. It's pretty easy that, you know, we could just be done tomorrow. And, you know, she goes out, she realizes what she's been given. Look, if you realize that, you know, you're no longer in risk of going to hell forever, you should have that same feeling. Like, you want to run out and tell other people about this. I mean, if you don't, I, you know, if you don't, are you even saved? No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm not going there. But my point is this, okay? My point is this. You should have that feeling. You should have that feeling within you that you know what you've been given. You know that you're no longer in danger of hanging. You're no longer hanging over that fire, so to speak. And that's this woman. She went out and got all these people saved. And then the Samaritans, verse 40, they were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, that he would stay. And he abode there two days. They asked him to stay for two days. And many more believed because of his word. So here they beg him to stay for two more days. And look, not every, you know, you know not every word that Jesus said is in the Bible. I mean, he stayed there for two days and preached to these people and got a whole bunch more people saved. So, you know, half the people got saved, not half, but a bunch of people got saved from this woman's words, and then the rest came to him, or the group came to him, and then he got a bunch more saved by his own words. Okay, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Even the Samaritans knew about Jesus, or about, the, about not Jesus, about the Christ, the coming Christ. So look, he abode there two days, he got all these people saved. What's the application of this story? What's the application of this story? So we see Jesus soul winning here. This is a great example for us in the Bible. We see, I mean, we see the Lord Jesus Christ out soul winning. I mean, what can we learn from this? First of all, what does he do? He says, you're a sinner. I mean, he had a much more simple approach. He says, basically, you're a sinner to this woman, and I am the Messiah. But as we can see, the Samaritans already knew about the coming Messiah. They already knew the stories of the, you know, they had either heard about it, but basically that was his message. You are all sinners, and I am him. That was his message. But here's the thing. Jesus knew what she believed, and he knew where her heart was. So the first point is this, when we're out soul winning, you know, remember this, you are not Jesus. You are not Jesus. We do not give soul winning presentations here, and I've said this maybe a million times, and I'll say it a million and one, but we don't give soul winning presentations here based on what we think people need to hear. Okay? We don't go out and give soul winning presentations because, because here's the thing, we're not Jesus. We can't tell where the holes are. And here's the problem, just like the soul winning tip today. Here's the problem. 
people are so twisted up. That, look, that's the downside of 99% of these churches having a false gospel is that they've all got it twisted in just a little bit different way. It's nearly impossible to figure out just on where somebody goes to church where their shortfalls are. I mean, that would be an impossible task. So look, we must be thorough. That's a culture here. Amen. We must be thorough soul winners. Or look, we're going to have false converts. I mean, if we want to go out, we just want to rack up a bunch of, you know, salvations on maps. We want to get our number in the bulletin just skyrocketing like crazy. That's one thing. But I have no interest in that. None. And we keep track of the salvations because it's kind of a way for us to kind of see, you know, the labor that we're doing. But, I mean, the point is, we don't want false converts. I mean, you can't, look, after, I mean, even talking about the tip this afternoon, we can't take for granted that people understand eternal security. You can't take that for granted. Why? Because of the culture that we live in today. That's why. Because of this, this Protestant culture. This Protestant culture where, you know, people will literally tell you, oh yeah, it's grace through faith. You know, but yeah, oh, but yeah, oh no, you can't do that. Oh yeah, you, you can't, you can't do that. You better have some works or the works or a lot of works or it depends on who you talk to. Or you can lose that grace. You can fall from grace. And they'll define, redefine falling from grace as, you know, losing your salvation. Look, it's this crazy veiled works mix that's out there with everybody. So we can't take anything for granted. You know, I mean, look, some people will say, some people will say, yeah, you know, you're right. I mean, people will confuse you to the point of saying, you're right, God will never let you go. Yep, I agree. Grace through faith, God will never let you go. But you can walk away from him. I mean, there's all, I mean, all this stuff, you will hear all of these different things. So eternal security along with the rest of the gospel, look, there's so many hang-ups today. There's so many hang-ups today. Here's another one. Just, you know, this fear of damnation. Or belief in damnation. That's a hang-up. If people don't have a belief in damnation, that's a hang-up. If people don't believe that, you know, I mean, here's, how many times have you heard this? How many times have you heard this? Yes, you have to, you have to do X, Y, and Z, and it's all different things for whoever you talk to to get to heaven or to stay saved or to whatever, right? And then I always, look, I spend a lot of time up front trying to get to the bottom of what these people actually believe because it's the only chance you have of getting them saved. You got to figure out. It's kind of like, you ever go fishing with your kids and like all you ever do is untangle fishing lines? Like everybody gets all their lines crossed up. You got to really concentrate and figure out, okay, I mean, you can't just sit there with two lines that are tangled up and just start spinning them. You got to like sit there and look and be like, okay, this one has to go this way. You know, in five foot seas. You know, that's fun. You know, but I mean, you have to literally figure out every single turn to get the hook. Oh, the hook's got to go through that loop, this. And you got to spend like, you know, time doing that. To unwrap, look, you got to unwrap these people. So you got to figure out exactly how tangled they are. That's why I spend that time up front. But here's these people. You got to do X, Y, and Z to get to heaven or to stay saved or whatever. And then I always say, okay, what if, let's say they said you have to get baptized. The person we met today, you have to get baptized to be saved. Okay, what if I don't get baptized? And then I get, you know, hit by a car or I should die the next day and I was not baptized. What I'm trying to get these people to say is then, yes, you would go to hell. Yes, you would not go to heaven. But what you will get is this. What you will get many times, maybe 90% of the time you meet these people, is, is this. They just don't believe that there's damnation. You say, okay, what if I don't get baptized, and then I end up dying tomorrow, unbaptized? And then you get those, most people will say, well, I think God will forgive you. This is a person that does not believe in damnation. This is a hang-up. This is a major hang-up. Why? Why is it a major hang-up? Because what, what am I going to convince them to be saved from? What am I going to convince somebody that thinks that they just listed all the things that you have to do to get to heaven? And I say, what if I do none of those things? Well, what, and then I die. Well, I go to heaven. Oh, I think God will still forgive you. There's a person that doesn't believe in damnation. They don't believe in a God that would ever throw anybody in hell. That's a hang-up. Why? Because why would they want to be saved? Saved from what? They're not hanging over any cliff. Everyone's going to heaven. 
I'll, I'll continue with this person. I'll continue with this person, and I'll, you, I, you know, I'll finish this thought. And I'll say, do you think everyone goes to heaven? And then at that point, they'll be like, well, you know. I'll try to get them to really actually tell me what they believe. Look, here's the thing, folks. Most people just have a lot of contradictory thoughts in their mind. You know, I hate to say this. I don't like, I don't like having two thoughts that I can't logically connect in my head. But there's a lot of people that just haven't thought this through. Because they're like, they know all people aren't going to heaven. They know that because that would be, seem absurd. And Jesus actually answered that question and said that, you know, most people aren't going to heaven. But they know that, but then they, yet they have this foolish belief. So the, the two, but here's the thing. I mean, we have to unwrap these people. Just because most people are idiots and they don't think through and come up with, you know, the logical connectors to make, to find a philosophy that at least makes sense, which the gospel lines up all that. So, I mean, I'm just trying to find out what they think it takes to get to heaven because once you find that out, then you can start with the gospel with these people and you can say, look, I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm going to start at the beginning and I'll point out, a lot of this may be review for you. I'm sure you've heard of a lot of this before, but I'm going to point out where the Bible says something a little bit different from what you told me. And then that's why you need that information that they gave you up front so you can say when you get to Ephesians 2, when you get to Romans 6.23, you know, the second part of it, you can say, do you see how that's different than what you told me at the door when you said X, Y, and Z? That's the only chance, it's the best chance that you have of getting these people unwrapped. And like, I'm not saying it's 100% effective but it's, it's the best chance. So look, here's the thing. Here's the methodology of this church is that here's the methodology. This is all you have to remember. The methodology of this church out soul winning is anybody that is unsaved gets the whole thing. Amen. Amen. They get the whole thing. Let's start at the beginning. And you just go through it. And look, here's the thing. Romans 3.10. You just go right to the center. And they, they may have heard it, but you can say that, okay? Here's the thing. If somebody's not going to listen to you for 20, 25 minutes, don't get into this habit of, you know, this will just take me a couple minutes. And then pretty soon you're rushing. And pretty soon you're dropping stuff out of your soul winning presentation. And pretty soon you get used to doing that. And pretty soon you're giving a four minute gospel presentation. We don't ever want to be those people. Look, I mean, there is, I, I get it, folks. You want this person at the door to get saved. I get it. And when they're, conf when, they're, when they're busy looking at something else, they're not giving you their full attention, you just feel like maybe they have a five-minute attention span. Look, you can't give the gospel in five minutes. It's just that's not your fault. That's not your fault. And I understand that we have the hearts. We want to see every single door that we knock on have those people be saved. But we give the whole thing. That's our culture here. And then you tell those people, you see how that's different from what you told me at the door? And you know what you'll have people say? Yeah, I do see how that's different. You know what? Now we're looking at repentance. That's what you're facing now. When you get that person that says, you know what? I do see the difference there. And, I, and then you can, you can show them that the right way and they can turn from that belief that they gave you at the door. Let, and then, you know, you let them decide. You let them decide if they're going to repent or not. Look Jesus, can, look, Jesus can see the heart. This is the whole point that I'm trying to get. And, and I will even point that out before I pray with people. I will even point out before I pray with people. I will say, look, I will say, look, I'd like to lead you in a short prayer. And these aren't magical words. As a matter of fact, it, this is a prayer between you and God. You are telling God what you believe in your heart. The sky's not going to open. Lightning's not going to come down. As a matter of fact, I'm just a man. I can't see your heart. Jesus could see your heart. Jesus could see this woman's heart. Look, it's all about, it's not about, you know, speaking, you know, a chant. It's about what you believe and telling God that with your mouth. We're not magical prayer people, and we're never going to be magical prayer people. 
So the point is, we see Jesus, can see the heart, and I just want to make the point tonight that, you know, we are ambassadors of the gospel in this church. It is a huge responsibility. It is a huge responsibility. We are ambassadors for Christ, brothers and sisters. So we're going to do a good job. We're always going to be thorough with the gospel here. If people are unsaved, they get the whole thing every time. Let's bow our heads and have a word.